OK, this is a video looking at 1 Corinthians 11 verses 2 to 16. As you can see on the screen, I've taken my face off the camera because you don't need to see my face. You can see the passage. That's the most important thing. Uh, let me pray. This is a tricky passage, so we need God's help. Heavenly Father, some passages are hard to understand. Some are hard to accept. And this passage seems to be both. Please have mercy upon us and please help us. Help us to see how this connects to our lives today. And... Um, May it help our church, what you say in your word. Renew us by your Holy Spirit. Amen. OK, just to remind us of the theme of 1 Corinthians, true Christian spirituality is shaped not by human power, but by the cross. Um, and um, we've, we had chapter 10, verse 31, do everything for the glory of God. Remember, remember our memory verse we had last week? Chapters 11 to 14 seem to be a new section um, about church gatherings. Um, so food sacrificed to idols might have been one aspect of their getting on together as a church. Should we eat it? Should we not eat it? Well, for the sake of others, that's the decision. Do it for the glory of God. And then chapters 11 to 14 about practical matters about their church gatherings. And this bit, uh, chapter, uh, uh, chapter 11 verse 2 onwards, True to verse 16 is about men and it's about women, as you can see. But, well, let's dig into it. I praise you for remembering me in everything, verse 2. Praise for them and for holding to the traditions just as I passed them on to you. These traditions, I'm just going to make a comment here. Um, the, it would be the, it, it's not about traditions as in, well, we start with two songs and then we have a confession and then we have notices and then, you know, it's not like that kind of tradition, like um, Christmas traditions and things like that or service traditions. Um, it's a tradition is, is basically, um, it's it's the truth. Um, maybe we should think of creed. You think of the creed, it's, it ex expresses the truth, holding on to the gospel truth um, and put equals gospel. Yeah, just as I pass the truths of the gospel on to you. Um, and part of this, um, you yeah, know, they're holding on to that. So that's praise. But part of what he's going on to, verse three, is the issue of the role of men and women in the church. This is the um, hot potato. Um, a hot potato causes controversy. These are confusing verses. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to focus on the simple things and the clear things the obvious things, to help us understand the more difficult things. There's a general principle. Use the simpler things to understand the difficult things. Paul says, up verse 3, I want you to realise, and notice the pattern, that's why I've laid, put it this way, the head of every man is Christ. Okay, so Christ is the head of every man. Then the head of the woman is man. Okay, there's a problem for us, isn't it? Uh, the head of Christ is God. Right here, I want to say um, that this implies, because this is because uh, of the parallel stuff here, that at least the head of Christ is God. And I'm going to put a comment. These um, are equal. God, the Son, Christ, the Father. Okay, and that suggests that being head does not mean superior, okay? Because they're equal. They have so head means something else. Um, and then I've got a comment here from below. Um, below then, um, man. This does not mean man is superior to woman. I hope you see that logic. Of course, it doesn't quite follow in this line. OK, so there is a way. But all I'm saying is that um, it, head does not necessarily mean superior. OK, it's talking about something else. Obviously, Christ is superior to man here. But that's this. So, you know, if you were just to read this verse, you'd say, oh, head means they're superior. But actually, these two lines, that line followed by this third line, means therefore head does not equal mean superior in every context, in every way. And so um, it means something else. Let's hold that thought. 
we get this really troubling stuff that we find hard to understand troubling stuff hard to understand stuff about heads being covered so every man who prays or prophesies with his head covered dishonors his head and his head is christ okay we'll put that in brackets here christ um but every woman who prays or prophesies with her head uncovered dishonors her head man okay um now this could be husbands and wives but there's something about this head covering which um, makes us question what is this this covering and uncovering um just to carry on with the woman it's the same with having her head shaved so if she doesn't if she has very very short hair it's uncovering her head what is this head covering again we can only guess and speculate lots of people have let's carry on verse six for if a woman does not cover her head she might as well have her hair cut off it is a disgrace for a woman to have her hair cut off or her head shaved she should cover her head i think this is saying that um let's just write it as it says it women should cover their head okay now I'm just making, I'm not saying that that's true for all time, I'm just saying that's what verse 5 and 6 is saying. And then um, verse 7, a man ought to cover his head, since he is the image of and glory of God, but woman is the glory of man. I, I'm not going to puzzle over what this is all about here, but I'm just saying here, um, men should have their head uncovered. Okay, that's what all of these verses are saying, I think. Now, I think the thing is, um, the distinction, the, the purpose of this, I think, is that verses 8 and 9, you've got four here, man did not come from woman, but woman from man. So this is um, back to Genesis 2, isn't it? Adam and Eve. Neither was man created for woman, but woman for man. Um, let me make a comment here. This is um, man needed help. <laughs> of course they need help we need women <laughs> man needed help um woman is the answer yeah so um and this is um this is all genesis 2 then so verse 10 is puzzling it is for this reason that woman ought to have authority over her own head because of the angels now what does this mean is it that she has the authority over her own head she is the ability. Lots of people think that. Is it that the man is the authority over her own head? But that doesn't quite make sense of this word authority. It seems to be that she most likely is the one who has the authority over her own head. So it's kind of woman has the freedom to choose to have some sort of authority over her. Because the angels is problematic as well. I don't really understand that. And so I'm just going to put don't worry about this verse no one knows it, and this is this is this is the situation where you have no idea what paul is saying on the phone and you can't hear what's being said on the other end we, we just don't know okay verse 11 nevertheless if the in the world woman is not independent of man nor is man independent of woman okay so this is about quality We need each other. For as woman came from man, so also is born of woman. Man, man is born of woman. Everything comes from God. Okay, this is a nice verse, isn't it? We can live with verse eleven and twelve. Um, verse thirteen: Judge for yourselves. Hmm, this is to the Corinthians. Is it proper for a woman to pray with her head uncovered? This is going back to here, isn't it? Women should cover their head. Okay. Does not the very nature of things teach you that if a man has long hair, it is a disgrace? If, if a woman has long hair, it's a glory. So this is going back to the same thing. Women should cover their head. Men should be uncovered. Or long hair is, is the covering here. And verse 16. If anybody wants to be contentious about this, we have no other practices, not of the churches of God. Comment from me here. Um, this was um, controversial. Shall we say that? Controversial in the first century too. Okay, I think we use the easy to understand the hard. So this this passage is not denying the equality of men and women. I've got that there in verse 11. 
we see it in verse 3, more implied, but it is there nonetheless. Um, and then we've got to work out what is this head and this covering. And I think the point is, I think the point is, there's a distinction between men and women, men and women, and the distinction is that um, in Corinth in the first century, and it wasn't, it was the same not so long ago, men would have short hair and women would have long hair. Maybe the women had hats. And much has been said about women needing to wear hats in church. This is about church. It's not about life. But it's about um, general life. But it is about, um, you know, it's about church gatherings, what's happening in church. And um, it's about praying and prophesying. I notice that women, um, this one is her head. And it, uh, let me just let me just make a, a point here. Um another comment women can speak up in church sometimes you hear this idea that women should be silent shouldn't say anything but no women can pray or prophesy can't they um let me underline that it's important to emphasize in a passage that seems to easily easily read to say women are second class to men we've got to deal with what this head means what does it mean to be head i think the idea is as it means elsewhere in the Bible, is it is, uh, Christ is a head for man. It isn't just the boss, but it's the servant. Um, it's the servant who serves and leads in the service, sacrificial service. Let me make a comment of head equals um, leading by serving sacrificially like Jesus. And that is the key. To be a head in the church context is not to be the boss who gives all the instructions and must be obeyed. To lead and to be a head in Jesus' church is to sacrificially serve and to put the interests of others above yourself. And that is what Paul is causing, calling men to do here. Um, and uh, that's what this is about. So it's about just maintaining the distinctions between men and women about how they are dressed or how they appear. And um, it's maintaining that um, in creation. Uh, so it made that creation distinction in the church and um, how the church is run. So I think the easiest way to think about this is how it applies. Let me reveal to you my theme sentence that I prepared here. Genders are equal and different in marriage and church. Now, the reason I put marriage in there is because there, we're a bit unsure as to whether the word for woman and man here is wife and husband. Could be either. The same Greek word was used for both you know, husband and man and woman and wife. Aim with from this would be to honour Jesus through your gender in marriage and church. But the main thing I want to get into is how this all applies. So um, here are some applications I came with because I think you can understand, you can look at these principles, but you kind of think, yeah, how does this work in practice? You talk about equality of men and women, so the stuff I've written in red, equality, but then you talk about distinctions, and then you're saying that men have some head role. How does this all work out? And it is controversial, it was controversial back then, it's not just cultural, it's controversial today in our world that likes to smooth them out. And I just want to say, look, we've got to treat men or women, boys and girls, equal respect, you know. They're equal, equally made from God and need each other. Be content to be the gender God has made you to be. Sometimes we kind of say, well, I want to be that of a gender. But actually, look at your body. It tells you about your gender and that, yeah, it speaks to the transgender um, issue. But we need to... To do this lovingly and sensitively. I have no idea what it's like to feel like you're the wrong gender. Um, must be very distressing. And so we need to have pity on people and not condemn them. Help them to acknowledge the way the Lord has made them. Um, which comes from the body, not from something inside. And I guess what was happening in Corinth is that the men and women, some men and women were saying, well, our gender, our, phys our bodies don't matter. It's all about the spiritual stuff. Um, but actually, um, our bodies do matter. 
Okay, how else is like allowing women to speak up? They, they can pray and prophesy, so they can speak up in some way. There might be disagreement about preaching, but that's certainly true. The speaking role of ministry for women is affirmed in this passage, and so we need to affirm it. Here's another way I think it applies when it talks about men being ahead, men are to take responsibility for spiritual matters. Okay, we don't just leave it to the women. And um, come on, men, we need to step up. That's what that's saying there, I think. Step up. And then lastly, we say no to stereotypes. So we need to maintain our distinctions between men and women in how we look. I mean, it's, you know, women wear trousers these days and men can have long hair, but there are still distinctions in the way we look um, and the way we're trying to be. Think of lipstick, jewellery. Um, certain kind of hats, yeah, um, shoes, that kind of thing. But even that is cultural. And the thing is, we want to say no to stereotypes, such as what men and women do. So we say uh, we want we want men. We, the stereotypes. I mean, this is saying men. Come on. Why do we leave it to the women to do all the children's work in church? We don't actually in St John's, but that has been the case many a time. Or to leave them to do the cleaning or the washing up after our lunch on Sunday. No, men, we need to get in there um, and take a lead, um, as well as the spiritual matters. And then, look, men just say, well, well, look after the building. No, no, no. Um, women need to be involved in that. They've got a role in terms of praying and speaking into that. I'm just giving some examples here. Um, so we say no to the stereotypes because men and women are equal, but actually men, uh, we have got this uh, leading role. Well, that's what I'm gonna say. It's it's not simple, but I would stick to what are the things that we can affirm. If I'm doing a Bible study, I ask what can we affirm in this passage? And maybe point to specific verses and um, and then, and then talk about what, it, what what would it look like? What does this look like? And 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 get people to really wrestle with it because he's dismiss it out of hand. But now we want to wrestle with it and hold on to it and see actually, is it if we read it more carefully, what is how is this challenging our church? How is it how is it challenging men to do things differently? And how might it challenge women to relate to men in a way that might be helpful? Our church fellowship. Um, churches tend to be stronger when the men are involved and, and wanting to grow men rather than just socialise and sit on the seats and let, leave it to the women. So um, yeah, have a great time preparing a Bible study on this passage. Let me pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you have made each one of us male and female in your image for your glory. We need each other as men and women in, as, in, our, in our families and in our church and uh, we're equal we can all speak your truth in some way uh, lord god we thank you for christ the way that he leads us by sacrificially serving on the cross dying for us and we pray for the men of our church that they would do the same for all of us we pray that we'd work well together men and women in in various ways you call us to and uh, lord we pray that uh, you would help us to serve one another well in the way that you've made us to be. Amen.